Good afternoon. Human rights and democracy are under assault in the Philippines. I belong to a freedom-loving nation on the other side of the world that had been the very first in Asia to wage a revolution against its colonial masters in 1896, and consequently, the first to adopt a republican constitution in the Asian continent in 1898. In 1986, a nonviolent popular uprising ended the 21-year rule of the dictator Ferdinand Marcos to restore freedom in our land. We had long been considered a bastion of democracy in a region where, to this day, most countries remain predominantly governed by tyrants. The world hailed us then as an example of what people power could do and how the promise of democracy could be fulfilled. Sadly, after just one generation, this promise has been broken. Today, the Philippines is at a critical crossroads whereby our people will choose either to return to a path of renewing our faith in democratic practices or to follow the alternative path of populist authoritarian rule that is currently sweeping the world. In 2016, 30 years after the restoration of democracy, President Rodrigo Roa Duterte, popularly elected with a sweeping mandate, launched what he called a war on drugs as the centerpiece program to a strongman platform to establish what he promised to be law and order in our society. As it has unfolded, this so-called war has become a war against the poor, against human rights, and against the rule of law. The starkest indicator of this war are the sheer number of dead people. Literally thousands have been shot without even an arrest, a trial, or other judicial process. Independent observers have characterized most of these deaths as extrajudicial killings. A vast majority of those who have been killed are poor people living in the slums of our cities and other urban areas. Hardly anyone has been held accountable for these deaths. The president himself has called for extreme measures to be taken against what he describes as a primary menace to society even proudly comparing his campaign to Hitler's final solution. He has regularly encouraged the security forces to do what they will, free of any real legal constraints and with personal assurances that they will not be prosecuted for pursuing his directives. In one particularly deadly night in August last year, the police conducted what they called a one-time, big-time dragnet in the capital and nearby provinces that resulted in 57 persons being killed, the highest single death toll in a day. Asked about this, the president even praised this as a good result, declaring that this should be replicated each day and across the country. Human rights defenders have sought domestic remedies to challenge this strong-arm approach, but to no avail. And by all indications, state authorities remain unable or unwilling to end this impunity. Thus, despite glaring breaches in constitutional safeguards of due process and presumption of innocence, as well as violations even of established police operations procedures, very few, cause, uh, very few cases have resulted in charges being brought in court against the perpetrators. Despite courageous opposition by some, the killings in our streets have continued unabated. The government responds to, these few brave, to those few brave enough to stand up against this has been disturbing, swift, and relentless. Institutions that serve as countervailing forces in our society against abuse of authority are being undermined or their mandates curtailed. As just one example,
the Commission on Human Rights, which I have the honor to lead, placed, uh, faced the prospect of having its budget reduced to just about $20 a year by a Congress controlled by presidential allies. Fortunately, this attack on our institution had to be abandoned due to a strong public outcry at that time, and our original budget was ultimately restored. Many of the leaders that had been personally targeted as enemies by President Duterte are strong and independent women. Gender advocates and women's groups note that this is not coincidental and have called out our president for his constant sexist and misogynistic statements, some of the most egregious being several public comments about rape that he would then regularly dismiss as merely that he was just joking. Even international voices have been subjected to intimidation because the International Criminal Court decided to open a preliminary examination into the recent events in the Philippines. We are now only the second country in the world after Burundi to have withdrawn accession to the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute is the treaty that created the ICC and allows jurisdiction to prosecute a national of a state party for crimes against humanity. The ICC has already begun looking into the tens of thousands of people that have been murdered by our government's war on drugs. And the United Nations has in fact also expressed serious concerns about this in our recent Universal Periodic Review. Now, our president wants to make sure he is out of their reach. He has even threatened to arrest the ICC prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda, should she dare come into the country. The Philippine case that I have just described is but one more instance of an increasing global trend. A recent Time magazine cover has proclaimed the rise of the strongman. The argument of the strongman is not new. Its proposition has always been simple and straightforward. It essentially offers the false choice between the uncertain future of living free in a democracy with its regular contestation of competing interests and the guarantee of some security and stability that is offered by a strongman in exchange for diminished freedom. The strong man rises, carried to power and propped up by a wave of popular support, driven by a perception of his decisiveness, fueled by tough talk and a post-truth narrative, with a readiness to undertake quick fixes or make undemocratic shortcuts on behalf of populist pandering to the masses. This is the challenge to democracy today in my country and elsewhere, especially in places with weak institutions that are unable to ensure separation of power and particularly an independent judiciary and strong parliaments. Nonetheless, it is still possible for all of us to collectively stem the tide to be able to push back in defense of freedom and democracy. The first step to take is to acknowledge our shortcomings. We must admit significant lapses in not recognizing this democratic crisis much sooner. We believed or perceived that the system would fix itself because we probably refused to see that it, wa that it was already broken. Democracy, at least partially, has not been able to address all the aspirations of our people, at least as it is. Now is the time to reimagine a vision of democracy, not as it was, but as it should become. We cannot merely participate in a project of just restoring democracy. Rather, we must nurture a citizen's movement that would rebuild and renew democracy for the future. Yes, we will need more democracy, not less of it. 
more transparency, not fake news, more mechanisms to check against abuse of authority. The world has changed. Our democracy must evolve as well. We each have a responsibility to mount a response to this existential challenge that will affirm our most cherished values of truth over deception, the power of the people over, the, over strongman rule, and hope over despair. But we must do this together, building a solidarity to pursue a politics of civility and inclusion and employing nonviolent strategies in our parliaments, in our courts, in the cyberspace, and yes, also in our streets and in our communities. We must ignite courage and push back. Each day, we should direct a righteous anger in a manner that is both purposive and strategic towards those that would deny us our dignity. If we fail to do so, we will see the unabated consolidation of authoritarian rule. We are all called to protect human rights, to defend the ramparts of international justice, and to deepen our democracy in order to ensure that all who seek to diminish and negate our freedoms will be held accountable. Thank you.